Towers. I play bass in Shearwater, and today I'm going to talk about The Secret Life of Arabia. It's the last track on Heroes. Uh, it's a bit of a controversial track, uh, not not because of like the content of the song or anything, but that it appears on the record at all, or the placement. Some people say that it doesn't fit. Um, I think it's a wonderful moment of levity because the second half of the record is so, you know, there's a sense of doubt, which is really heavy. Moss Garden is a nice little, you know, a bit of serenity. And then Neukölln, and I think to have ended it on such a heavy song definitely would have put you in a place, um, which is not a bad thing, but I think Secret Life of Arabia is just so delicious. So this bass line in particular, it was really difficult to learn. Like, since it's not like a typical, like, you know, bass part where it's like... Which is a great bass part and everything, but it's like, you know, there's like these little sections and you just kind of like repeat the bass part and then you get to the chorus and then you play the chorus and then you go like go back to A. This bass line doesn't do really any of that. When I was learning it I was wondering why it was so difficult to hold on to anything and I started counting the number of measures until it repeated itself and it doesn't repeat itself until that vamp section that comes two minutes in. I was talking with Carlos Alomar uh, at one point and I was like, dude, what's the, what's the deal with Secret Life of Arabia? And he laughed and said that it was this joke that they played um, on George Murray. And we're like, oh, it's just this joke we played on him. And we said, all right, you can't repeat yourself for, for 16 bars. And then he did it. And so we said, all right, you can't repeat yourself for 32 bars. And then he did that. So then we said, all right, you can't repeat yourself for 64 bars. And then he did that and I'm like, all right, now play it in 6-4. Um, and then they basically just took this bass line and put it on top of the rest of the song that was like in 4-4. Four, four. I'll give you a little of an example. So one of the things that helped me get through learning um, the bass part was to figure out what stayed the same because it doesn't, it's not like it's just completely changing and everything is completely different. Like there, there's the, um, that starts the phrase. If you break it down and think, all right, I can hold on to this and you think of it less as like a bass part and think of it more as like a call and response, um, which is something that you hear more in like big band jazz. You hear it also a lot in like 70s horn sections. Um, so if you think of it as like less of a bass line and more of like a tower of power horn part. So, you know, you've got the da 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 and then the, you know, ba da ba 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 da there, there are a couple of things within the bass line that it, because it's not just the Like, it's not just that through the whole part. There are these less claustrophobic bits. Um, there's this one that I call the um, the Daisy Buchanan on her third martini part, and that's the... Um, where she's like narrowly missing falling into the pool. At least that's what I imagine when I play that. And I think that's... Um, something else about this bass line is getting the, f the feel for it and getting the sling for it and the, the the sway to it is just as important if not more important than the actual notes like once you get the notes like that's i mean as miles davis said you know like the note is only 20 percent 
but how you play the note is 80%. And so one of the things that I visualized when learning the bass part is that it reminded me so much of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, like thinking of sand and like endless blue sky as far as you can see. And then since it is so flamboyant, it does kind of make me think of drag queens a bit, like the, the, the two of them, um, like the desert and feathers and rhinestones and just like, like sashaying and owning it and going for it. So that's really like the imagery that I tried to like channel uh, as I was learning it to give it the the right feel. Bowie gave his musicians a lot of a lot of freedom. Um, if you listen to like say Beauty and the Beast and you listen to the recorded version and then you watch live versions with George Murray, the same bass player, playing the bass part, the bass parts are different and Bowie was totally cool with that because you know the recording was one thing and the performance was the performance, you know, and there, people were there to see a show and you know, you had to like ramp it up, play a different like feel the the crowd and feel the 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 stage. Um, so I didn't feel compelled to necessarily play it exactly the same. Um, and having that knowledge of how Bowie he gave that freedom to his musicians kind of set me free in a way. But also, it was it was too delicious of a challenge to not try and play it as as close as possible to the original. So thanks for watching, and if you have any other songs that you would like for us to uh, do a behind the scenes of, please leave it in the comment section.